Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Brantley, and then last name Rutz. Did I say that last name right? That's it. Nice. Yes. All right, that Brantley. Well, you know, so Brantley, we've been friends on uh, Facebook for a while. You've been a huge encouragement. And so I'm so glad that, you know, as I'm reaching the end of intellectual conservatism, I'm able to have one of my last interviews be with a really good friend. And so, Brantley, we're going to talk today about your conversion to Catholicism. But I know that you have your own kind of social media following and platform. So tell me more about, like, you know, where people can follow you and um, look at your stuff. Sure. Yeah. So uh, first of all, Swan, thank you so much uh, for having me on. And, and just like you said, you know, we've been talking for a while and uh, man, I, I definitely consider you uh, a friend, man. And I just want to say thank you so much because um, obviously I feel the Lord led me to where I am, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, but, uh, but you played a, a huge part in that along with some others that I won't even begin to name here because I'm sure I'll leave somebody out. But uh, man, so thank you so much again, not only for having me on, but for for all of your labors. And of course, congratulations on um, on entering the uh, Dominican order. Um, very, very excited for you. But uh, but yeah, you can find me, uh, of course, on Facebook, Brandon Rudds. But uh, where I mainly have been hanging out is uh, my Instagram page that started about three months ago now. Um, and it's called the caffeinated catholic um and so on there i just you know i love to engage with uh of course i've met some amazing uh catholic it's so awkward by the way i don't know what to call what we do because it all sounds cringy catholic influencer <laughs> yeah, right, catholic right. creative <laughs> i'm like i try to stay away from those terms but you know for uh for the sake of kind of explaining it but I've met some other Catholic creatives who have been nothing but wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so being new to the Catholic church uh, on there, I'm posting, you know, reels that are humorous, but also trying to use it as ways to put forward my Catholic faith, uh, what the church teaches, what I found helpful along the way, things that I discovered that may be helpful for others. Uh, I post a lot of stories, things that I'm reading, things that I have read, uh, addressing things that were at one time hindrances to me and now that are you know that I've kind of discovered and hopefully helping uh either those that are catholic curious or you know want to know why we say or believe the things that we do mm -hmm. uh and for people that are cradle catholics or also new to the faith uh that maybe they can pick something up along the way um you know that, that I have and again you know I've I'm indebted to folks like you and all the other uh great you know, Catholic YouTubers or, or writers and theologians and theologians and thinkers that I've uh, read along the way, man. So yeah, so that's kind of where I've been hanging out the past few months is uh, at the Caffeinated Catholic and just, uh, it's been great. And again, the biggest thing is just um, getting to connect with individuals just all along the different parts of their journey. And if, you know, Lord willing, if I can help in any way, shape or form, then I certainly want to do that. You know, I really appreciate how, you know, with the caffeinated Catholic, there's humor, but there's also times where you go into deep analysis. And I think it's really important for people to see that, you know, as Catholics, we're happy, you know, and we're like normal people who like, like, ha like yeah. to have fun. And we can also be on social media and we're devout and we're expressing our faith. Because I think sometimes people think like, okay, either Catholics are, you know, like just so staunch and, you know, traditions of men or they're so kind of like liberal that they don't care about their faith and they're just going around not reading the scriptures. But I think what you've shown at least online and you know, what I've been trying to do, I, I really like how you mentioned how we're trying to minister to not only in our Protestant brothers and sisters and those who are seeking, but also even cradle Catholics and people in the church. And so Brantley, I'm interested to just begin with um, your journey then. Uh, you know, so if I recall, um, you were Baptist originally, is that correct? Or what would yes. you identify as? Yeah, so we, that was kind of one of the things that I appreciated. And I can't remember precisely when I first came in contact with you, but I remember that mm -hmm. was one of the things that we shared in common is coming from a Baptist background. Uh, more specifically, uh, so I mean, I, yeah, I was raised in the Baptist church, Southern Baptist, uh, more specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and when I got into college, because I actually went to college, it, you know, I had a bachelor's degree in theology. I thought that I was going to pursue ministry specifically in the Baptist tradition. But during college, I started reading more reform guys. Uh, a lot of the ones that, you know, anybody listening that would be uh, kind of from that camp or in that camp currently, guys like John Piper, R.C. Sproul, 
on and on and on. And people I would say in some ways I'm still indebted to uh, because of some of the things that they taught me, my love for scripture and all that. So in college, I started, especially right in my, uh, at the, uh, my senior year, drifting more towards the reform side of the Baptist tradition and spent you know, probably about a good decade almost in that camp. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my theological leanings, uh, definitely Baptist uh, and lean more towards the reformed or Calvinistic side of the, the Baptist tradition. And growing up, I mean, what was your impression of Catholics? Was it ever on the radar or, you know, like, what were you thinking about? What, what were you raised to think about Catholicism or what did you think about Catholicism? Yeah. So I didn't have a lot of interactions, but there are a couple of stories that do stick out in my mind. Um, I don't know if you had this or mm -hmm. you were familiar with this. Were you uh, familiar with evangelism explosion? No. Okay. That was like a big thing, at least in the nineties. I don't know if it still is around today, but they used to have these little pins with two question marks. And it was mm -hmm. like these two questions that you would use to engage someone like very Ray comfort style. You know, you go up to them, you start asking <laughs> questions and, and, uh, and so you would ask these two questions, you know, if you were to die tonight, you know, would you go to heaven? Mm -hmm. You know, if so, why would that be? And that was a way to kind of start drawing out what someone really believes or understands about salvation. And I remember uh, I was young. I mean, I was very young when I was doing this. And I remember going to the mall uh, at our local mall and asking uh, several people this, but one lady in particular. And I said, you know, ask her the questions. And she very bluntly said, I'm Catholic. And then just kind of made her, <laughs> made her mm -hmm. exit away from me. I was like, okay, fair enough. You know, and of course, at that time, you know, I'm young. I, I don't know exactly what I was thinking, except for, man, that was really harsh and awkward. Yeah. Uh, it was more, I also kind of thought, well, you know, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get into heaven, just saying mm -hmm. I'm X, I'm Catholic or, or whatever. Uh, outside of that, um, my, I don't really have, I, you know, before I came into the church, I didn't have a lot of family or friends, period, that were Catholic. Uh, I had one, one, one friend of mine in particular and his wife, you know, and we spent the last several years you know, going back and forth on uh, what, you know, me defending my faith against Catholic Church, that sort of thing. So growing up, I really didn't have a lot of engagement with Catholics. Um, and I, I will say, you know, I didn't grow up in a fundamentalist type of church where you heard a lot like Catholics are going to hell, like Jack Chick, you know, track style, even though I did have some of those, the old Chick mm -hmm. tracks. I don't know if you're familiar with those that were very anti-Catholic. Uh, I did. I do remember seeing those. Um, but that wasn't really the vibe of our church. So I didn't really have, you know, my, my, the pastor who I still dearly love, who baptized me. Um, you know, I never really heard anything that I can recall from the pulpit where he was railing on Catholics or anything like that. Um, but I do remember, so my maternal uh, grandfather mm -hmm. uh, was raised Catholic. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Um, definitely wasn't someone I would say was, would be exemplary. Uh, you know, exemplar of the Catholic faith. Um, so I think that colored the lens a bit, not only for myself, but, but really for my, my parents and some of my family. Uh, but his mother, so my great grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, was devoutly Catholic. And I remember when she passed away when I was young, I don't know why this sticks out to me, but I remember my mom saying that she believed that my Nana went to heaven mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, kind of in spite of being Catholic, mm -hmm. she really, she was one of those Catholics who really loved Jesus, you know? So it's like, you know, she, you know, almost like I saw that people like that were the exception and not the rule. But, mm -hmm. you know, to be fair, I never heard a lot of Catholic bashing from my church, my family. But we definitely would have seen Catholics as individuals that needed to be evangelized for sure. Right. Right. So then, um, like, what kind of changed or what was the first moment where you were kind of thinking like, oh, maybe... I don't know, was it like, oh, Catholicism kind of burst on the scene? Or was it more like, I'm starting to realize maybe there's something wrong with Protestantism? What, 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 yeah. you know, which one was it? Yeah, so um, it was like this, it was almost like I was um, kind of cutting through a forest. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I never expected what was on the other end of it. Because like, <laughs> I knew what was ever, whatever was at the other end, it wasn't Catholicism. Uh, but as I continued to kind of cut away the brush, brush with my machete, um, eventually when I got to the end, you know, that's, that's where it led me. So if, if you ask me, you know, or if I would have, you know, I've thought more about this recently, 
Um, because I would have said really it, it really started at the beginning of last year, but I think it went further back than that to probably two or three years ago where the, the ground was kind of prepared and tilled. And I didn't really recognize fully how much it had been prepared until I was all the way in, or at least I was like, you know, this seems to be the direction I'm heading. And, and what I mean by that is this. So around the beginning of last year, um, I, it re- so the pursuit kind of started off more as a, a, a fatherly pursuit. Um, I've got four kids, you know, I'm married, I got, I got four children. And um, as a Baptist, my children had never been, they never received the sacrament of baptism. And I was very, I was pretty confident uh, in, in my Baptist understanding of baptism. However, mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? And, and again, you know, when I mentioned some of the reform guys that I read earlier, a lot of these guys were Presbyterian. So this wasn't like, you know, I was reading guys that I would, you know, agree with 98% of the theology. It was just that one big thing. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to give another fair shape to this. You know, my oldest was getting ready to turn nine. And I'm like, you know what? I really no, she was turning eight at the time. Sorry. And I was like, I'm just going to really take another look at this. And so I started reading Presbyterians because, like I said, I was pretty much almost all the way there. I was even looking at Presbyterian churches in the area just in Mm -hmm. case. And um, as I'm reading the covenantal arguments, you know, because that was a big thing. There's Baptist covenant theology. There's uh, Reformed covenant theology. And they each have their subtle nuances. And the Reformed covenant theology really began to make more sense because what I saw the Presbyterian authors kind of putting forward is like, you know, Baptist, for instance, or what I would have said is you're making an argument from silence. Nowhere do we see in scripture uh, the command to baptize children. Well, the Presbyterians would say children have always been included in the covenant. Mm -hmm. So we need to, we need you to show us where we're told that they should not be included in covenant especially, and I don't want to get too into the weeds right now, but especially when you see like Luke 18, you know, children being brought to Jesus, Mm -hmm. the disciples kind of stiff arm them. And Jesus says, no, let the children come to me. And it says, even infants were being brought to them, to him. And he blesses them. And he says to such belong the kingdom. Now that's not a baptism passage, Mm -hmm. but it just seemed odd to me, kind of in light of all the other evidence as well. But it definitely seemed odd to me that Jesus would say, bring them, to such belong the kingdom, blesses them, and then it goes, oh, by the way, in the new covenant, we're keeping them out. You know, it just seemed really <laughs> odd. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, if that were the case, we'd need to be told. And so when you kind of, when I saw that covenant to lens and that grid being kind of laid on top of scripture versus the, the Baptist grid that I, I so, you know, for so long placed of it, I placed on it, you know, Passages like the Oikos Baptist, the, the household baptisms made much more sense to me. But along the way, what I began to notice is that when those authors would point back to the early church, mm-hmm. you know, as, as far back as, back as they could, and they would say, you know, when we start seeing um, baptism in, in children being addressed, you know, infants are being baptized, and we never really see anybody saying this is an apostolic or you know, this is a new tradition that's being introduced and really pushing back. So it's like, okay, that, that added another level of weight to the argument. But what, I, what really began to kind of turn the wheels is they were always very quick to say, hey, but now they didn't really have a well-formed covenant theology. What, you know, they understood baptism more from a, a regenerative aspect. And they were very clear, like, that's what the early church really held to is this regenerative understanding of baptism. And so that, I would say, was kind of the first pebble in my shoe that I was like, that's interesting, you know. And that was where things kind of started to begin. And I'll I'll kind of go more from there. But to take it back a little bit further, and this is what I meant when I started really thinking on it, I think the ground was prepared before even that. Um, Because when I started opening things up, I was talking to Anglican friends and, and, you know, I've been watching a guy that has a popular Lutheran YouTube channel for a few years, Um, you know, and I was kind of looking, okay, well, I know I'm I'm not Baptist anymore as as I'm kind of going through all this. I don't think I'm Presbyterian. I remember reaching out to some Presbyterian friends and they couldn't really, 
in my opinion, sufficiently answer some of the issues I was seeing with, you know, hey, here's what the earliest Christians believed. Mm-hmm. You know, why do you believe this? Or why would I, you know, need to believe what Presbyterians believe in light of this? Um, I kind of started putting these traditions like Lutherans and Anglicans and, and kind of everything on the table. Um, for the past few years, I've been watching a, a guy that was Lutheran. And, you know, even though at the time I didn't agree with him, I start, he started pointing out things like justification mm-hmm. and how different his understanding of justification was than mine. Going, you know, I had this very forensic sense of justification. And, you know, he was delineating between, you know, forensic and ongoing or progressive justification. And, you know, my mind, and I even was reaching out to a friend of mine who's a, still, you know, a Protestant pastor, good friend of mine. And I, I kind of, I was like, man, what do you think about this? He's like, yeah, actually, I, I, I'm on board with that. Like, I, I believe his view. And so, again, the, the mm-hmm. wheels had started turning, like, maybe, maybe I'm getting something wrong. And again, that was you know, a couple of years before all this started really happening. And so from, from baptism, uh, I really started looking to the Eucharist um, and just kind of speed things up a little bit. I mean, I, very quickly, uh, reading, you know, uh, the works of, of guys like Dr. Grant Petrie, um, looking back at some of the earliest uh, writers, especially when I mean, you talk about early writers like St. Ignatius, um, you know, and you start seeing people referring very clearly to uh, the Eucharist as being, you know, the flesh of Jesus, our Savior that was crucified. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I, I was on board with a, uh, you know, kind of the real presence view. But again, that didn't immediately say, ah, oh, Catholicism. Um, again, for a while there, I really looked hard at Anglicanism. I mm-hmm. uh, had some friends that were Anglican. You know, it's, the way I put it is like, it seemed like, you know, they call it, you know some people call it the, the Via Media. It seemed like the nice little way where I can have, you know, some of the liturgy and the beauty. And I could have, you know, um, I could point to the early church and, you know, things like regenerative baptism and the real presence. Uh, but I don't have to tell people at least that I went Catholic. You know, I'm still Protestant, <laughs> they, like, especially in the South. They're like Anglican. What is that? Like, are you, be, you know, do you have to uh, change your citizenship? Or, you know, you're still American. Like, what mm-hmm. exactly is going on? You know, God saved the queen. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I really started um, looking hard kind of at Anglicanism, Lutheranism, uh, Orthodoxy. And, of course, in my mind at that time, it was like, God forbid, Catholicism. Because I've spent so many years knowing that Catholicism could not be true. Mm-hmm. And uh, so those are the things that kind of led me along the way. It began with baptism, went mm-hmm. to the Eucharist, and then the final nail in the coffin for me really was um, the papacy. I mean, that was that was it, because it's the most distinctive doctrine. And uh, as I've heard it said, and I even said, I think Joe Heschmeyer was the one I heard kind of put it this way. But I kind of had my my own formula uh, formulation of this, but but he says it much more succinctly, which is to say, if the papacy is true, everyone should be Catholic. If it's not true, then no one should be Catholic. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, instead of spending years uh, trying to figure this out, especially when all of this began, well, I want I need to baptize my children. You know, I didn't want to wait any longer. So that was the thing that really became the nail in the coffin for me. Yeah, I mean, I just love how your story begins from the fact from the fact that you're a father, right? And then from there, you know, you're interested in baptism, baptism infants, and then you started realizing that. Um, well, I think you started realizing the nuances in Scripture because I think you know there's some Protestants who kind of believe in what is it, the perspicuity of Scripture, where it's like, oh well, you know, it's obvious, you know, you just you, you do your hard ex- exegetical work, and of course, you know, like you're, you know, my Baptist theology is correct or my Lutheran theology, and then you start realizing, oh, okay, so we might maybe tradition is it really important too to kind of break some ties and you know figure out what did the earliest christians believe and so you were interested in kind of a historical method uh, having a historical faith that was consonant with what the earliest christians were saying so while all this is happening um how'd your wife react (laughs) (laughs) so um man i thank god for and and you you probably you already know this but you know my entire family we all entered the church at the same time my children were actually baptized the week before my wife and i were confirmed so it was was a joyous time um but it was a big it was a big deal for her um i'm very thankful that she came to the church with me because i know that's not everyone's story 
I mean, my goodness. I mean, it took, you know, what Kimberly Hahn, what, four years? And it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's Scott Hahn. Like, if, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, if anybody can convince someone, you know, it's Scott Hahn. And yet it took his wife, you know, four years. But everybody has their own journey. Everybody has their own story. But my wife, you know, she saw me. I mean, I was pouring hours and hours just into the, the infant baptism thing. I mean, pouring through books, listening to podcasts, watching lectures, like, she saw the, the time that was being spent uh, pouring into that. And so as she saw, and I'm ta- you know, telling her as much as I can, you know, I'd get probably 15, 20 minutes in, probably 15 minutes or less in to explaining that, you know, something new that I discovered or was reading. And I would just kind of see her eyes begin to glaze over. <laughs> I knew that I'd lost her. <laughs> and so I was, I try to be very gracious with her time and, and not putting too much on her. But she, you know, she kept, she just kept saying like, this makes sense. Like it really does make sense. Mm-hmm. But just, you know, when I kind of, kind of got to the point where I knew I wasn't Baptist anymore, um, that was a big enough deal for her. Mm-hmm. And as I, you know, as the weeks and the months kind of went by and things were progressing more and I kind of went, I don't know, like, you know, I got to at least consider Catholicism, you know, the, the further back in history I reach and, I'm you know, looking at these more historical traditions, these more liturgical traditions, these that have, um, you know, it seems roots that you could at least in certain aspects of the theology could point back to the church. When I even mentioned that I was putting it on the, the table, I, I remember where she was, where she was sitting and exactly what her reaction was, which was, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. but at the same time, like she, I think one of the big things, uh, there's a couple of things, but one of the big things is she, not one, she saw the time I was spending in prayer mm. and study that it wasn't something I was just willy nilly like, oh, this seems cool and trendy, especially considering the fact that she had heard all the conversations that I was having mm. with my Catholic friend um, who, you know, I, I never felt it had made convincing arguments Um to lead me away from, you know, my Protestantism. So, I mean, she knew how, and when I say staunchly opposed to the church, you know, again, I wasn't anti-Catholic in the sense where, you know, I was calling, you know, the Catholic church, the whore of Babylon or anything crazy like that. But I did see, you know, I I was concerned for my Catholic friends. Mm -hmm. And so she knew, um, you know, she, she knew that I wasn't doing it, uh, as like I said, some kind of trendy thing. I mean, I was, if, if I was putting it on the table, it's because I was taking it serious. But yeah, she was very much uh, opposed to it at first, at least in the first conversation. Uh, but again, the more, same with the baptism thing, I just, you know, was very gracious in my time and sharing your little tidbit, tidbits mm-hmm. of what I was reading. You know, I was telling her, I'm like, hey, I'm watching this seven part series by the Swan Sauna guy, you know, and he's, you know, <laughs> and he's making these excellent arguments. And, uh, but no, um, Anyway, so yeah, so uh, just graciously kind of, and she had her own things, you know, like the papacy, sure, like, but for her, you know, that that kind of stuff was, you know, more in the weeds and ethereal, but for her, there, there were little things along the way that it was her own journey, you know, specifically, yeah. I remember the bit, one of the big things for her was like the Marian dogmas, completely yeah. understandable, like after the papacy, like that was certainly probably the next biggest one for me. The, the big thing for me, though, is like once I got the papacy, I, I knew I was like, OK, well, I can trust, you know, the teaching office of the church. You know, this is something that Christ instituted. Therefore, I trust it because I trust Christ. Mm-hmm. And so um, that that was an easy thing for me. She she was more, you know, boots on the ground, practical. Like, what does this mean? Completely understand that. And uh, and that's one thing I found is like it's amazing some of the times like the things that convince people. Yeah. You know, versus like me, you know, I'm like the papacy and I'm like all these things I'm studying. And some people are like, oh, yeah, I just read the story of Fatima. I thought it was really cool. And like I, I was done after that. Like, <laughs> that was it. You know, I was like, that's it. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, so she had her own journey. Uh, but yeah, she was at the beginning very, you know, very like, no, you know, I'm good. And uh, but man, here we are. And uh, yeah, I'm very thankful. And one of the things mean, it's just cool because like right now she's homeschooling. And we just got a, a bunch of books in for our curriculum. And I was laughing. It was like a couple of nights ago. And I was laughing because she's got all the new books spread out. And it's just everything, you know, uh, we're, you know, doing classical education. But so many of the books are, you know, teaching uh, them the catechism and mm-hmm. the faith. And it's just so awesome, man, to see 
And uh, it's like, wow, you know, just, you know, a couple of years ago, I could have never envisioned this, you know, you know, being us. It's, it's pretty cool. How'd your kids react? I mean, did they have any thoughts where they're like, dad, what, what's going on with like, we're going from this to that? Like, what would they think? <laughs> yeah, you know, so they're, <laughs> they're young enough. So they definitely all know like, okay, you know, it's a little bit different. You know, we're yeah. going from, because the last church that we were part of was definitely Baptist and it's kind of in its uh, theology. More in, uh, at least the pastors were definitely more reformed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a, it was a what they would call multi-denominational, multi-denomination, non-denomination. Mm -hmm. To me, I call them all secret Baptists. It's like, okay, guys, you know, it's like, uh, or maybe Bapticostal, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was definitely a different vibe, right? Like we're going from, you know, band, you're playing guitar, all that kind of stuff, which, you know, I know there may be some churches out there where that, that is the case still, but um you know, it, it was definitely a very different style. You know, we're not receiving the Eucharist. We're not going up to receive the Eucharist every week. And, and, you know, they're not going off to Sunday school, right? Like they're going in there, they're with us and they're seeing everything taking place. Um, they're seeing us weekly receive uh, the Eucharist. And, you know, so they, they definitely, you know, even our youngest who's too, like they, they kind of see that something's different, especially the oldest. Um, well, because there were so many new things and now we're talking about Mother Mary more, you know, mm -hmm. and our, my wife and our conversations and I'm praying the Hail Mary with them. So I'm, you know, there's there's definitely conversations like that that have happened. And I've always said, by the way, that, you know, if you want to know that, you know, your theology well, try explaining it to a six year old. Right. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. When they start asking you about the Trinity and you have to put it in terms where you're not allowed to use terms like homo -usius and <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, right. how do I explain this? You know? And, uh, and then of course you could pull out a three leaf clover, but then you get into uh, yeah. you know, partialism and, you know, and <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that satirical video, but I know. Uh, oh yeah. The, oh, yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so, but you know, getting to explain to them like why, you know, why we're going to this church now versus, other. plus they're, you know, mom and dad are going to RCIA, you know, every week, like they're, we're talking about confirmation, we're talking about them getting baptized. So there was a lot that was going on that was new for them, you know, and we're starting to decorate our house, uh, you know, with pictures of, you know, more icon iconography and Mary and, and, and saints. And so, you know, so much going on. And so getting to explain to them, why we're doing that and uh yeah so definitely a lot of conversations are had but it's so funny and it's so cool now because one of the things that we've talked so much to them about is the beautiful gift that we get to receive in the blessed sacrament in the mm -hmm. eucharist and so they love talking about the eucharist as a matter of fact this morning my son had he put on like this little um uh, it was almost like a like a vestment like he, had, he was pretending it was like a vestment for, for the priest and he had a candle, like a golden candlestick uh, holder, <laughs> and he was giving it to our oldest, like it was, you know, like she was receiving the, the Eucharist. And, and they love playing, like oh. they're, you know, giving each other the Eucharist. It's it's awesome. So, yeah, it's it's been great. Um, you know, we've always, you know, try to teach them the faith. But the one thing that I love about our Catholic faith is how tangible it is. Mm -hmm. You know, confession the Eucharist, like it's so tangible, you know, the prayers, the liturgy, you know, uh, one of the things that we started doing, I, I pray the liturgy of the hours. So at night we do the night prayers together. You know, I bless them with holy water, you know, so it's just, it's just so cool to, to get to see those tangible signs and explaining to them, you know, why do we do this? Uh, and it's just a, a great way um, because I know that, you know, these things are more caught than they are taught. And so when they see us living out our faith and they see these tangible ways that we practice our faith, um, of course, my prayer as a father is that these things stick with them throughout the remainder of their life. So, yeah, it's, it's been great. My last question for you, Grant Brantley, is just, um, you know, for those who are investigating the Catholic Church and they have questions or hesitations, do you have any advice or anything that you'd want to tell them? Like, you know, maybe you wish you had known during your journey. Yeah, um, you know, I'll say one thing, uh, probably the biggest, and I, I really would say maybe the only regret is like, let's say that um, you're someone who's maybe pretty convinced or at least 
has seen enough to be like, I've got to take this seriously, and you're already involved in a church, I would encourage you um, to try and, and make sure that uh, your pastors are involved as much as possible. Like I would, I would be very upfront and, and honest and clear about it because maybe they can give you some things like, you know, Hey, have you thought about it this way? And it's, and it's a way to kind of really think through your faith to kind of um, maybe reinforce what you've discovered in the Catholic and, you know, in, in your journey to the Catholic church. Um, I had, and the reason I bring that is I did have one pastor. Uh, there was a good friend of mine. He was at another campus though, of the church that I was at. And so he and I were having these conversations, but I really did not have these conversations with the pastors at the campus that I was at, who were, I considered friends and were, um, you know, involved, you know, were, were you know, more involved in my spiritual growth and my spiritual life. Um, that I, I kind of sprung it on them late in the game, mm. really caught them by surprise. And that was definitely a regret that I've had. Thankfully, I've been able to squash that and we're on good terms. And this like one of the pastors, again, who I consider a dear friend, like, We've had lunch and, and breakfast several times since then. So everything is good there. So that's one encouragement I would have. Um, but yeah, I would just say the biggest thing is really, you know, obviously read, study, look at it from both sides, but pray. Um, that was one of the biggest things for me, especially as a husband and a father. Uh, I was terrified that I would leave my family, you know, because I'd spent you know, however many years believing that the Catholic church could possibly be a false church because they preach a false gospel. Mm-hmm. So that was terrifying for me thinking that as, you know, God has given me this leadership role in my home, um, that I would ever lead my family down a path that could be destructive for them, for their souls, uh, not just my, my own soul. So pray, study, read, and, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing. It's nothing groundbreaking, mm-hmm. uh, but I would certainly, um, you know, say that, you know, take your time. You know, uh, for me, I definitely kind of, like I said earlier, I kind of felt this like I need to figure this out quickly because, again, I really wanted my children to receive the sacrament of baptism. It's just a matter of like where. Um, but, yeah, just, you know, continue to, to talk through it um, with, with others who are kind of on both sides of the, of the fence. That was one thing that I did. And uh, I just pray, let the Lord lead you. Well, Brantley, that was lovely. And uh, I just want to thank you for coming on to my channel again. Um, you know, as I enter the order, um, you know, I, I really want to keep in touch with all my friends and all the people who have been huge sources of encouragement. And so, Brantley, you know, keep in touch. All right. I want to, I want to know what's going on in your life, how your family's doing. Um, you know, and it'll make certainly make at least one Dominican very happy. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you so much. And again, I can't thank you enough for, for all that you've done for the church. I mean, you and I, you, you came in you know, before I did, but I mean, man, the impact that you've made. Uh, I mean, seriously, I mean, I've, I've got people that are uh, strongly considering the Catholic church. As a matter of fact, one guy that's uh, coming from a non-denominational background right now, he's meeting with a priest this week. Um, and these are, you know, I've been able to take your material, your content, point some of these folks in, uh, in your direction. And you just so thank you for the hours uh, and, and, you know, that you've spent uh, laboring for the Lord and for his bride, the church, man. Thank mm-hmm. you so much. I mean, you really I mean, you've been a tremendous help and encouragement to me. So I am very blessed to consider you a friend. I mean, truly. And so thank you for not only having me on you know, this evening, but for everything that you've done uh, for my family and, and, you know, I would say a legacy. I mean, truly, I mean, we've potentially changed the course of my family man, by, mm-hmm. by joining, you know, the Lord's church. So thank you so much. And of course I cannot wait to, uh, to keep in contact with you, you know, know how to be praying for you. Um, mm. Certainly. Yeah. Brantley in the end for him, it's all worth it. Amen. Amen, brother.